you have it, so. The annual the mission mail. of the Alliance is called the Jeffrey. Passed it up for Jesus. Oh, your granddaughter's recovery from an illness. Somebody else. Awesome weather. Yes. Oh, cup. Oh, so your daughter had an answer to prayer. Awesome. Oh, my goodness. We have lots of them. Yes. We, can, we have more blessings than we can count. Somebody else back here? No? Yeah? Somebody. Oh, right here, Teresa. The privilege of being here. Yeah, there was nobody blocking us from coming in. Cool. Somebody else? Oh, yes. Oh, family, friends, and the simple things in life. That's cool. Coming from somebody that's younger, right? Keep it simple. Yes. Yeah. A new roof on our house. Awesome. We're thankful. We're grateful. Yes. For health. Yeah. That's Tammy over there. She's new visiting here. Say hi to her after. Yes. All right. All right. Thankful for Pastor Adam and Jen. And uh, was that all the board or some of the board? Oh. <laughs> We appreciate your prayers. Somebody else. All right, let's, let's just pause. Let's bow our heads in prayer of thankfulness. Father God, we are so grateful that we can come here this morning. We can meet in freedom. Lord, we're thankful for the little ones below us in their own service right now. I'm thankful for the leaders there that faithfully lead our children in the truths of Jesus. And Lord, you've heard all the thankfulness that's out there. And we are thankful that we have found you, Jesus. Let us not take that for granted. We've been blessed. And we pray for our friends that do not know you, that we can bless on them, that through us they would come to find you, Jesus, as their, their friend. Father, we think of those who aren't with us this morning because of health or other disruptions in their lives. Lord, we pray for them this morning. We pray for your, your peace upon them. And through their difficulties, may they, be, may they find things that they can say, thank you, Jesus, for this morning. These things we pray in thy name. Amen. Are you ready? Stand. Let's stand together as we worship.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. In the death of Christ I live. When the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slay, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Thank you so much for the great singing. You may be seated. Good morning. It is a good day to be thankful. Many things to be thankful for. Friends, health, the weather. We can finish all of our projects in our yards that maybe previous years we couldn't because the snow fell before we were ready for it. Lots of things that we can be thankful for. So let's just pray together again as we get ready to open God's Word together. Father, we are thankful, thankful that we can lift our voices to you this morning, thankful that you hear us, thankful that you care for us, thankful that you want relationship with us. We know there are many complexities in our lives that go on, but at the end, Father, we just want to say that we are thankful. Thankful to you. Now, open our eyes, open our hearts to hear what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been working through our statement of faith, and I know it's not so exciting in a lot of ways. We may not be thankful for it. But in a lot of ways, we need to understand and know who we are as an Alliance Church, both globally, nationally, and locally. And these statements define and, and begin the process for us as how we operate as a church family. And so we simply titled it, We Believe, because these are the things that we as an Alliance Church hold on to as the, the basics, the standards, the foundations of who we are. 
And today we get to jump into uh, the Scripture, the Bible. And that's a big part of our statement of faith. And, and for some of you, maybe a bookshelf that you have looks a little bit like this. I, I was searching earlier this week about it. And, and how many translations are there? Nobody can agree. Okay. Hundreds. Thousands. How many different languages has it been translated into? Nobody can agree. The highest I saw was just under 2,000 different languages that the Bible has been translated into. And so the question then comes in, as I've heard from people, how can we trust this book when there are so many different translations, versions of it? Which one is the correct one? Which one has it all together? Which one portrays the message of the original languages closest? That's a loaded question. On my computer, I have a program, a Bible program that then amplifies the amount of versions that are on that picture to all of them. And I have never read all of them. And I don't plan on it. But all of them collectively together give us a glimpse, a fuller picture, a fuller image, maybe into what the Scripture is trying to tell us. I've been asked which version is the best version. And I'm not going to give an answer. Because each version has a place. Actually, my, 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 what I'll say is the best version is the Jesus Storybook Bible for kids. Okay? Because it simplifies the gospel message. It's one of my favorites. Um, which, which one is the best one? Well, each translation is translated to a particular time in history or a particular group of people for a different purpose than the other ones are. Some, some are translated word by word. And, and when you read those ones, you find there's a little bit of disjointedness sometimes in how it's translated because it's literally word by word. Other ones are voted or translated phrase by phrase. So they'll take a, a grouping of the words, a, a phrase that is said in, in Hebrew or Greek, and, and they'll translate it into the English language by that phrase so that it, it speaks as we would speak, so to speak. And then there's some that are a mixture of the two. And then there are some that are further down the line than others, and, and it just, there's a lot. And it is good for us to read multiple to get a larger picture, a clearer picture of what is said. In, in Scripture, in the Bible, that we, 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 we see all these different words for what it's called, and they're up here behind me. These are all found in our Bibles for descriptions of what it is. The book of the law, you find that in, in the first five books in the Pentateuch. That's what those first five books were called, the book of the law. The law of the Lord, scriptures, truth, words of the Lord, gospel, living words, the scroll, word of God, holy scriptures, message of Christ, sword of the spirit, word of life. And, and we've added more than just those, right? I remember when I was a teenager growing up and I was in youth group and they, and they said, you guys got to read the Bible. Brief instructions before leaving earth. I was like, that is weird. I was new to church at the time when I heard it for the first time. And it was, it was strange. It was weird. But it is true. Right? It gives us instructions to live by, ways to live life, who to follow. And then in turn, our lives will look much different. So, what is our statement? Our statement says this. The Old and New Testaments, inerrant as originally given, were verbally inspired by God and are a complete revelation of His will for the salvation of people. They constitute the divine and only rule of Christian faith and practice. All that to say, all those words, brief instructions before leaving earth. Simplified, right? There are some words that I want us to look at that we find in that description. Uh, and, and we'll see them on the, on the screen here. And the first one is this. The Old and New Testaments inerrant 
as originally given. Inerrant means the Bible, we believe in, in the Alliance Church and many churches, this isn't just the Alliance Church, right? But we believe that the Bible is inerrant, that it is without error or fault in all its teaching. And there's a very distinguished thing that they do in our statement here uh, that is not unlike others, and it says that it is inerrant as originally given. Meaning, when, it was, when, when the words were given to the people who wrote down in, in the scrolls and the scriptures, those moments were without error. Now, as it's been translated and all sorts of things have happened, there are potentials. We understand that for something to come in. But as originally given to those who wrote scripture, it is inerrant. It's without error. It's without fault. There's no blemish. One of the things that we hear from, from folks about scripture with when it comes to this, when it comes to this statement, is there are many contradictions in Scripture. There are many errors that we find in Scripture, and they provide text to prove all of that. and And we won't go into those today. But we believe, at the beginning, when God spoke to Moses, when God spoke to Paul, when God spoke to the Gospel writers, when He spoke to Luke, when He spoke to John and Peter. At those moments, when those authors wrote down the words that they were given, were without error, without fault, in everything that they taught, in everything that they spoke of. Okay. The next one. The Old and New Testaments, inerrant as originally given, were verbally inspired by God. So we believe that God verbally inspired, that God divinely influenced the human author's of scriptures. Now this is where we can get into different different conversations around does God speak today still or or how does God speak? How do we hear God's voice? And and we can go through a, a full sermon series on what that actually looks like. Right? I've talked to you guys about the gut feeling that I get sometimes. And Jen says to me, when you get that, I know that you're hearing from God. There have been moments in life where I believe I have heard an audible voice of God. The first time was really weird, and it's still weird today. It's not a normal thing necessarily when it comes to the world standards. We believe in the supernatural, though. So if I tell my friends outside of the church, hey, I heard from God, and they would look at me like, I was strange and weird, right? So we've got to be aware of that. But how do we hear from God? Do we hear from God? How do you hear God's voice? Well, we believe the people who wrote Scripture heard from God and, and wrote down the words that God influenced in their lives. So it was, they, it was verbally inspired by God. The next one that we need to look at quickly is the Old and New Testaments in errant as originally given. We're verbally inspired by God and are a complete revelation. Revelation, the process by which God reveals himself. That's not a very good definition, though, is it? If you gave that definition in class, the, your teacher would give it back to you because you use the same word in your definition. I get it. Revelation, God making himself known to you. God showing you his character. And there are different aspects of revelation that, that we also need to look at, and, and it's these, gen, general revelation. The general truths that can be known about God through nature. So there are times in our lives where, where we go somewhere, and we see something maybe we've never seen in the world, in nature, and we're just overcome with this sense of, Nobody could have created this but God. When we get to the top of a mountain, we look into the valley, and we look at everything that is there. Nobody could have created this but God. When we walk up to a mountain and see how small we are in the landscape of how big the mountain is, nobody could have created this but God. 
Jen and I are really excited, and in November we're going to go visit the Grand Canyon. Nobody could have created that but God. In June, when I was, I was sitting at a retreat center, and I was looking out at breakfast time out into the ocean where we were, and I saw some killer whales coming out of the water. Nobody could have created that moment and the beauty but God. When we look into all the, all the fields, nobody could have created that but God. See, general revelation is given to us through nature. To see his majesty, his, his work of hand, his artistic creativity right in front of us. And it's a beautiful thing when we see it, when we experience it, when we're captured by it. The other one is special revelation. So supernatural communication from God that has been given to humanity. God speaking to us. The Holy Spirit coming and, and changing our lives is all about special revelation. And those two things together give us that moment, that picture of who God is in our lives. So, we're going to jump to a couple passages now, but I'm just going to reread what our statement says. The Old and New Testaments, and errant as originally given, were verbally inspired by God and are a complete revelation of his will for the salvation of people. They constitute the divine and only rule of Christian faith and practice. I was asked this week um, by a mentor of mine to, to walk through or give us a picture of what the entirety of Scripture is. And I simply said this, and, and he couldn't disagree, so it was good. Scripture is God's rescue mission for his people. That was it. Now, when I actually do my full interview, I have to go further into detail for it. And, and we can talk about that another time. But basically, Scripture is God's rescue mission for his people. It's his rescue mission for you. And as we read through the pages of Scripture, and we, and we see creation, we see the fall, we see the period in between, and we see when Jesus comes and the redemption of Jesus and, and the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the burial, the resurrection. We have this faith because we get to see all of these things together. And this beautiful picture that God paints for us through Scripture, inerrant as originally given, verbally inspired, and through the revelation of Him, so there are some scriptures that we use that we that we use to justify our statement, and we use different passages to justify every statement that we have uh, with the Alliance Church, and and this is a couple of them for us this morning. I am keeping up pretty good. Second Timothy three sixteen is a fairly normal verse, a very uh, a verse that is well known, and it says this: God has breathed life into all of Scripture. It is useful for teaching us what is true. It is useful for correcting our mistakes. It is useful for making our lives whole again. It is useful for training us to do what is right. So there's a lot in there for us. And, and as I've mentioned before, I typically read from the New International Reader's Version, which is written for our kids downstairs. Because it simplifies it. And maybe I do it just for me, but I know some of you also need it simplified. Okay? But that's why I read from this version, because it just simplifies the truth in a way that we can understand it super easily. So, God has breathed life into all of Scripture. That's part of our statement. It's, it's part of who we are. It is, it is useful for teaching us what is true. There are many voices in our world that we know telling us what is true, what is untrue, what may be true, what is true for you, what is true for me. We often hear this phrase, do what is right by you. 
But because it's true for you doesn't mean it's true for me. We here, we believe that the Bible is what is true. And what we find in it is true, not only for us, but for each one of us here and each of us outside these doors. The trouble is, is that the approach we take with it, with those outside our doors. This is the truth, you must believe it. You see, Scripture also paints other pictures for us. We may think it's true, and that is good. It's a beautiful thing. We talked about it a little while ago when we were, and it was one of the the phrases that was used for what Scripture is, right? The sword of the Spirit. And we often use the Bible, truth, not as a sword, but as a cannon, as a nuclear weapon. And we cause more damage with it than, than anything else. And so we have to be aware, we have to be careful how we go about using Scripture for those who do not yet know who Jesus is. Okay. So, it is useful for teaching us what is true. It is also useful for correcting our mistakes. Those of us who believe the Bible is true must abide by what the Bible says and therefore teaches us what we have done wrong and what we are to do about it. Far too often, we, we look at what other people are doing and we're quick to point out others' mistakes in life, right? I do it every day with my children. They're always wrong. I'm never wrong. That's good parenting, right? There are times where I have to go to my children and say, you know what, I made a mistake. I screwed up. I didn't respond well in that moment. I didn't treat you well in that moment. And all of that comes from the foundation that I have that I know of Scripture. I asked the kids um, in class the other day, we were talking about goal setting and, and what do we want to be. And, and I said, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to become a better father. And so I asked the kids, I said, what would make me a better father? It's a dangerous question to ask grade seven students. Right? And they came up with great answers. Things that I can do to become a better father. But none of it was directly from Scripture. It was through their experiences with their own dads, good or bad, that said, this is what you can do to be a better dad. So as good as they were, and some of them I have adopted, they weren't founded in Scripture. And so for us to live life and walk through life, we need to be have our foundation in Scripture so that when we do make mistakes, when we do mess up, because we do and we will, We need to be reminded of it. Scripture is useful for making our lives whole again. And is useful for making our lives whole again because of the life of Jesus. Revealing him to us. That we may have life and have it abundantly because of the sacrifice that he made for each one of us here. And that last statement, it is useful for training us to do what is right, obviously the opposite of the mistakes. It, it trains us to, to walk in a way that is God-honoring, that shows people who Jesus is. Allows us to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. That's what Scripture does for each one of us. 
The other passage that we're going to look at is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. And it says this, Above all, here is what you must understand. No prophecy in Scripture ever came from a prophet's own understanding. See, Peter's reminding us here that everything came from God and God alone. He's reminding us that, that the writers didn't simply sit down and, 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 and read the past passages of Scripture, the book of the law that they would have had previous, besides Moses, because he wrote the book of the law, but everybody else after, and say, how can I contribute to the story that's already being written? How can I put my voice in, into what people are starting to collect together? How can I be a part? I feel like I'm missing out. You see, God revealed himself to various individuals, various people to write down the words that we now call the Bible. But like you and me here today, they were vessels of a greater mission that God had for them. We're not penning the words of Scripture anymore, but we're taking it to the world. See, I often wonder, I often wonder if we're jealous. And you're like, well, of course we get jealous about things. But I often wonder if, if we're jealous about the roles that we have that God has given each one of us. I often wonder if we look at the platforms that we have that we say, God, I wish I had more. God, I wish I was like this individual, that individual. God, I wish you gifted me like that, like that person. That would have been great. God, I wish you transported me back in time so I could have been a writer of Scripture because I feel like that would have more purpose and influence in, in my own life and other people's lives. See, God revealed himself to specific people at a specific time to write down the words of Scripture, not because they were better than any of us, in fact, many of the many of the folks that we know who wrote Scripture actually didn't write the actual words. They told it to somebody else who could write. Think about that. God used people, many of whom couldn't even pen the words that God was giving them. All they could do was vocalize it. And somebody else had to transcribe what was being said to them. God didn't use who we would consider qualified to write scripture. The ones who we give credit to. The names that we see all throughout many of which didn't know how to write. But they could sure talk. And so they got people who could do the work that they couldn't to form what we know today. Peter goes on to say, it never came simply because a prophet wanted it to. Instead, the Holy Spirit guided the prophets as they spoke. So prophecy comes from God. I often wonder as well, if the writers of Scripture were tempted to put their own words into play. Will people catch on if I put something different in there? If I just throw something right in the middle, will people, will, will people realize it? 
You know, sometimes, sometimes with, the, with the grade 7 classes, I'll often just throw something right in the middle of the class that doesn't have to do with anything we're talking about, just to see if they're paying attention. More often than not, I find out that they are. And then they're confused as to why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. But that would be my personality coming into play. Let's see if I can disturb the moment. And so I wonder sometimes if, if sometimes these writers of Scripture were, were like me in that they wanted to disturb the moment. Disturb the flow. Obviously, when we read this, we know that they didn't do that. But I wonder if that temptation was there. As an Alliance Church, we believe in the authority of Scripture. We believe that it was truly inspired by God. We believe that it was inerrant as originally given. We will preach from it. We will teach from it. We will hold to what it tells us in its collective form. We believe that it has the power to change lives. And as scripture tells us, we believe that it is there to correct us, to teach us, to rebuke us. And we believe that it calls us to community. And so again, church, we're calling you to community, not only to to live by these words, not only to read these words, but to take these words to the ends of the world. You heard a little bit about who Robert Jaffrey was, and, and I thank all of you who responded last week by designating some funds to the Jaffrey offering. You heard in the, in the story that it wasn't an approved mission that he went on by his father. And, the, and then the, later on in his life, it wasn't an approved mission that he went on through the Alliance, which is strange to me, but it's okay. But Robert Jaffrey's purpose, passion in life, was to take the Word of God to those who have never heard, to those who do not know Jesus, to those who have never heard. And so church, I'm calling us now to, one, if you would consider giving to the Jaffrey offering, please do. Two, for this book to become our rule of life. And three, for us to take it to the ends of the earth starting right here in Westlock. And seeing what God can do when we partner in His mission alongside Him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for all those who listen to You so that we can have this collection of your redemptive story, your rescue mission for Israel, for all your people. We thank you that you brought each one of us here this morning. We thank you that you desire to speak to each one of us, whether it's through your word, through, through nature around us, through a direct voice, through community. 
Father, we thank you that we can worship together. That you call each of us, each of us by name. Hear our praises to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And not only today sing it, but every day of our lives that we are grateful to our Father. service today. There are a couple of announcements for us. You just stay put there. Uh, Rosemary Wicks is starting a uh, women's study uh, starting October 11th. That's my anniversary. Jen will not be there. Sorry. It's 
a very important, it's 15 years that day. Pray for her. <laughs> Anyways, Women of the New Testament, great study. Uh, I've read through a bunch of it already. Um, be a good time to connect. Uh, 10 a.m. Wednesdays, Oak Ridge Manor meeting room. Uh, if you have any questions, please, please speak with Rosemary. Her phone number's on there. Send an email to the church office. We can get you connected with her as well, uh, if you wish. Next one. Membership matters. I've already heard from a number of you uh, wanting to uh, come to that evening. Maybe it's just for the free supper. Um, maybe it's to, to learn about membership. Either way, we're happy to have you. Uh, so please let us know. Email the church office. Uh, we'd love to have the conversation about what membership means for us here at Westlock Alliance Church and you uh, as we journey together in this. And thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm thankful that you came, that you worship alongside us this morning. May you be transformed by Jesus this week as you encounter him through scripture, through nature, whatever that looks like. Blessings on you as you go. Have a great week.